Snyder hospitalized. Radio Shack files for bankruptcy. I'm Dane Wormlinger. And this is Public Eye News. NMU will be hosting its annual Pump Up the Dome event this Saturday. The Superior Dome will have 40 bounce houses, games, and a climbing wall. Officials even report that Wildcat Willie will be around to give free high fives and hugs. The event will be held from 10 to 6, with general admission costing $12 and $4 for kids 4 and under. Minority Democrats in Lansing have proposed adding more paid sick leave in their new legislation. The proposal would grant employees one hour of paid sick time for every 30 hours worked. Backers of the legislation have argued that about 1.5 million Michigan workers lack proper sick leave. With a Republican-led legislator, the bill will unlikely pass due to Republican opposition. A 25-year-old man is set to be sentenced for home invasion charges in Marquette. Kyler Arrieta pleaded guilty for armed robbery on Thursday, and the charges of first-degree home invasion and felony firearm were dropped. He is scheduled to be sentenced on March 6th. The 25-year-old suspect who was arrested alongside Arietta, Jonathan Roy, is scheduled for a pretrial conference on Friday. He could potentially enter a plea. The two men alleg allegedly gained entry to a residence on the 600 block of Windcrest Drive in Marquette, where they assaulted uh, the homeowner and threatened him with a firearm. Two Sault Ste. Marie men were arrested and are now facing drug charges after police conducted a traffic stop. According to the Tri-County Drug Enforcement Team, the stop happened in the early hours of February 5th on I-75 in Chippewa County. Police discovered a large amount of heroin in the vehicle, and it's believed that the drugs were being taken to Chippewa County to be sold. A 41-year-old Jason Lawrence McRory and 46-year-old Jason Leland Roy, both from Sault Ste. Marie, were arrested and charged with felony possession with intent to deliver and conspiracy to deliver. Governor Rick Snyder was hospitalized Thursday morning after a severe blood clot. The blood clot was found in his right leg a month after he tore his Achilles tendon. A spokeswoman says the Republican governor was admitted to St. Joseph Mercy Hospital. Although all upcoming appearances have been canceled, he still plans on attending his budget proposal next week. However, Snyder will remain in a protective boot and scooter. A Detroit judge has ordered a teenager to stand trial for an attempted murder plot on her family. The 15-year-old girl and her 23-year-old boyfriend, Michael Rivera, are to appear at Wayne County Court for attempted murder and conspiracy charges. Prosecutors say the girl stabbed her brother last October with the guidance of her adult boyfriend. The court date is set for February 12th. And after the break, we'll be back with your national and international news. Stay tuned. This week on Media Meet, the midterm saw Michigan voters reinforce GOP control in both legislative houses and the governor's office. So where does that leave Michigan Democrats on programs and strategies? I'm Bill Hart, here with Great Lakes Radio News Director Walt Lindela. We'll find out from Michigan Democratic Party Chair Lon Johnson, this week on WNMU's Media Meet. Welcome back. A statement by the Islamic State group claims that an American female hostage has been killed in Jordanian airstrikes in the outskirts of the northern Syrian city of Raqqa, the group's main stronghold. The IS identified the woman as Kayla Jean Mueller, an aid worker whose identity was never disclosed out of concerns for her safety. The statement said she was killed Friday during Muslim prayers in airstrikes that targeted the location for an hour. Photos were published of the bomb site, which showed a damaged three-story building. The statement could not be verified, and American officials are still looking into the incident. Officials say two people are dead, and that there is no threat on campus after a shooting at the University of South Carolina in Columbia. CBS News correspondent Drew Smith has more. State agents spent hours inside this academic building which turned into a crime scene at the University of South Carolina. It's so close to home. You always think of it happening somewhere else, but not here. 
Even after dark, you could still see the fire alarm flashing in the windows. Over at a campus chapel, grief counselors held an open service for students to talk, meditate, or pray. We spoke with students about getting an alert of shots fired and the lockdown that followed inside several classrooms. And I was just amazed at how our class just came together. Like I literally saw the action, the policemen, you know, rushing to the scene. Savannah Ivo was late for class. Next thing she knows, a man in a bulletproof vest is rushing past her. Another police officer right next to him had his gun drawn as he was entering the building. State investigators did not reveal much, only that it appears this was an isolated murder-suicide and two people died inside a room. It is a very slow, very methodical process because you want to make sure that everything is documented, everything is correct. The lack of answers is not making it any easier for students who have to return to class in the morning. I don't know what feeling I'm going to have walking into that building again. I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to concentrate. I'm afraid that that's all I'm going to be able to think about every time I'm in class there. A Chicago daycare will be requiring all staff members to receive the measles vaccine after five reported cases. The Kinder Care Learning Center stated the new requirement after five infants were diagnosed. After a recent outbreak connected to Disneyland, health officials are being cautious of unvaccinated children. With children un under one unable to get vaccinated, they remain very much prone to infections such as the measles. One of the biggest names in the media is fighting for his reputation. NBC Nightly News anchor Brian Williams says he changed the facts of an Iraq war story he covered in 2003. Jeff Glor takes a look. Please welcome Command Sergeant Major Tim Turpak and Brian Williams. Last Friday night, it was a tribute to a soldier who Brian Williams credits with saving his life during the invasion of Iraq. When the helicopter we were traveling in was forced down after being hit by an RPG. Our traveling NBC News team was rescued, surrounded, and kept alive by an armored mechanized platoon from the U.S. Army 3rd Infantry. Very quickly, William's tale was disputed by soldiers themselves. One of them was David Luke, a flight engineer who says he took part in the mission. If somebody on the outside wants to embellish you know, what they did or didn't do, we know what really happened. Attacks on William's credibility mounted. On Wednesday, he acknowledged an error. I want to apologize. I said I was traveling in an aircraft that was hit by RPG fire. I was instead in a following aircraft. This is how Williams originally reported the incident in 2003. The Chinook ahead of us was almost blown out of the sky. That hole was made by a rocket-propelled grenade. Peter Latman is the media editor at the New York Times. At his core, what Brian Williams is, is a journalist. And he's supposed to be reporting the truth. And now he's come out and said that for years he's been telling a story that was essentially false. And that really deals a blow to his credibility before the viewing public. Jeff Glor, CBS News, New York. Boko Haram fighters from Nigeria have attacked a border town inside the neighboring country of Niger. The violence on Friday morning marks the second neighboring country attacked by the Islamic extremists recently. On Wednesday and Thursday, Boko Haram fighters raided a town inside Cameroon, killing 100 people and wounding 500. Abba Hassan, a pharmacist from the neighboring town of Boso, said that after an hour-long battle, the militants were repelled. Niger is a region where thousands of refugees have arrived, seeking shelter and safety from Boko Haram attacks elsewhere. On Thursday evening, the troubled tech retailer Radio Shack filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy. The company's plan calls for an asset purchase agreement with hedge fund Standard General and Sprint to use a store-in-store -store model, which would allow the Radio Shack name to exist in as many as 1,750 of the acquired shops. Their surviving stores' branding would primarily feature Sprint, according to a Standard General statement. Radio Shack reported assets of $1.2 billion and debts of $1.39 billion as of November 1st. And after the break, we'll have your weather and sports. Stay tuned. Good, good. I good said, really I said dip, dip. No, dude, no. Nobody knows. <laughs> This week on High School Bowl, the start of the Cerebral 16, our playoffs, the quarterfinals. In our first game, the Escanaba Eskimos take on the North Central Jets. Hi, I'm Jim Kosky, and then in our second game, a team that has to travel 150 miles to get here, Sault Ste. Marie, takes on a team that has to travel 
12 miles to get here, Ishpeming. That's coming up this week on High School Bowl. Welcome back to Public Eye News. I'm Chelsea Birdsell here with your weather. If you can look behind me at the Academic Mall, there's a slight flurry that's going on, so definitely wear your gloves and mittens when you're going outside today. Looking outside, currently it is snowy with a temperature of 19. Winds coming out of the north-northeast at 8 miles per hour with the pressure at 30 inches and holding. Tonight it'll be snowy with a temperature of 12 degrees with winds coming out of the east at 4 miles per hour. And tomorrow it will also be snowy with a high of 20 degrees and winds coming out of the east at 10 miles per hour. Going ahead and looking around at the UP, in Sault Ste. Marie it is 40 and partly cloudy as is the rest of the UP today. In Manistique it is 24. In Escanaba it is 23. In Menominee it is 25. In Iron Mountain it is 22. In Ironwood it is 19. Up in Houghton it is 14. And back here in Marquette it is 19 degrees and also cloudy. Looking ahead today, you're going to see on Sunday there's going to be a high of 17 degrees, a low of 4, and going to be snowy. On Monday, a high of 19, a low of 7, and also partly cloudy. And on Tuesday, a high of 16, a low of 11, and snowy. So I think things in around the UP are getting kind of chilly, but I hear things are heating up with the Red Wings today. That's right, and hopefully for the Pistons as well. Awesome. Superstar running back Adrian Peterson was in a Minneapolis courtroom this morning, along with the NFL Players Association. The association, along with Peterson, is suing the league to overturn the suspension given to Peterson over four months ago. Last September, a Texas grand jury indicted Peterson on a felony charge after he whipped and injured his four-year-old son. Peterson is taking his case to the federal court, hoping that U.S. District Judge David Doty will side with Peterson and the union. The Minnesota Vikings have expressed interest in Peterson's return next season, but have not made a public comment on the incident. The Detroit Red Wings defeated the Colorado Avalanche yesterday 3-0. Peter Morozik, filling in for veteran Jimmy Howard, had 28 saves for his first shutout of the season. Detroit came in with the league's best power play and improved to 8-1-0 in its last nine games and pulled two points behind Tampa Bay for tops in both the Atlantic Division and the Eastern Conference. The Wings now hold a record of 30-12-9 and, and next will take on the Arizona Coyotes tomorrow night in Glendale. The Detroit Pistons will take on the Denver Nuggets tonight at the Palace of Auburn Hills. The Nuggets, one of the lower teams in the Western Conference with a record of 19-31, and 31, are looking to end a four-game losing streak. While the Pistons are coming off of a loss themselves Wednesday against the Indiana Pacers 114-109. The Nuggets have won eight of the last nine matchups between the two teams. The Nuggets winning the last matchup 89-79 on October 29th. Tip-off is tonight at 7.30 p.m. So, Dan, I hear classes are getting constricting for a college in Vermont. Yes, very, and it's a very interesting story. A student at Castleton State College in Vermont has sent out an email asking everyone to keep an eye out for a missing boa constrictor. Officials at the state college say that the four-foot-long Brazilian rainbow boa went missing from its cage at the zoology lab earlier this week. However, the snake isn't dangerous as it's only been trained to eat frozen dead mice. Reports say it may have been stolen as the door to the lab was locked. Police in Cape Canaveral, Florida, didn't have to investigate too much to find the suspect who robbed a convenience store on Monday. 25-year-old Benjamin Alexander Shaw demanded money from a Circle K clerk and threatened to bring back a gun if he refused. The suspect got the cash but left behind some important evidence, his wallet with his ID inside. The investigation consisted of checking the ID and driving to a nearby location to pick the suspect up. It's a pretty interesting story there, you know you know, leaving some important evidence behind. Definitely had to be an easy case for the police. Definitely won't be hard to convict him in court. Yep. <laughs> and uh, that's all the time we have for Public Eye News today. We'll see you next week.